Hello and welcome to round two of the Parenting Roundabout podcast. I'm Terry Morrow and I'm here with Katherine Holeko. Say hi, Katherine. Hi, Terry. Usually on this podcast, we talk about parenting issues, but once a week, Catherine and I like to get together to discuss TV, movies, books, and other entertainment topics because it's nice to talk about something other than parenting for a change. This week, we're talking about the West Wing episode, The Fall's Gonna Kill You, and we're going to continue our challenge round with the sad, sad movie last five years. But first, Catherine read a book. I did. What book did you read, Catherine? Uh, it's called The Postmistress by Sarah mm-hmm. Blake. Um, it is set in um, the early part of World War II, um, mm-hmm. prior to prior to Pearl Harbor. So, um, okay. And it tells the story of this little tiny town in Massachusetts, a fictional town, um, and sort of how how that town is responding to the threat of war and Mm -hmm. also parallel with that the story of a young woman who is a reporter in new york city and goes to london to cover the blitz oh um and then she ends up um going into europe to try to cover the refugee crisis that's happening um as the jews flee from Germany and mm-hmm. Eastern Europe. So, um, and it's, I think one of my fellow book clubbers described it very well when she said it's all about order versus chaos. Ah. So you have the, the postmistress of the town in Massachusetts of the, t- mm-hmm. of the title. Um, and she very clearly represents order because she's all yeah. about, you know, making sure the mail gets through and following all of the procedures and rules that mm-hmm. make that happen. Um, and then you have the war correspondent, you know, in the middle of chaos all the time, um, you know, running into shelters and subways, when bombs go off, um, returning to her apartment to find half of it just gone, you know, blown away. Um, And eventually the two stories come together um, in in the form of this doctor from the little Massachusetts town who loses a patient and feels compelled to try to to respond to that by going to London and helping treat people there. Um, Mm -hmm. Leaving his brand new bride back at home, Massachusetts, uh, (laughs) waiting for letters from him. I was just going to say, I bet he writes her letters that the postmistress (laughs) delivers. Exactly. Um, So it goes on from there. And it's... um, we generally liked it, but we also had had issues with it. I mean, I found that sometimes the writing got very sort of flowery and, oh. you know, overly interested in itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> I liked the character of the reporter and she, you know, she was very idealistic and like, we have to tell the world what's going on and no one's listening and why aren't they listening? And, um, all these portraits really haunting stories of these people who were fleeing from Hitler. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then on the other hand, the postmistress, you know, was just wonderful with her. Like, just like, <laughs> this is the way it is. And I'm doing things, you know, like I follow yeah. the rules, but yet she had this, this man that she was falling in love with at the same time. So you could kind of see her, letting her guard down a little bit with him Uh um but yeah but there was a lot of death i mean not just not just the war (laughs) but you Mm -hmm. know the patient and um that caused the doctor to leave and you know some other Mm -hmm. beloved characters by the end of the book like there's one at the very very end of the book and you're just like really Uh. like that was so (laughs) not necessary (laughs) you know and it wasn't even it was it wasn't like somebody went off to war and died it was different Mm -hmm. and we all were just like come on why'd you kill that person that wasn't nice (laughs) but yeah but it, it it was great at setting the scene and there was some great work on the characters okay so the post mistress by sarah blake all right what is your next book 1984 
Oh, I don't wow. really want to read it, but that's what... That's a little uh, on yes, the nose. that's why we're doing it, but <laughs> that wouldn't have been my choice, but hey. Oh, happens. man, can you be sick that week? <laughs> I would not possible. want to. I think I read that. I'm sure I read that at some point. Oh, in school, I'm sure you did, too. But, yes. Like, yeah. So that's next. <laughs> we'll see if I if I manage to do it or not. <laughs> yeah, I think that you would, could be excused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we may not be talking about it here on the podcast, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but y'all feel free to go read it, feel and I'm sure you can find it. plenty of commentary on it online. Oh yes. I don't think I've read it since, you know, high school or whenever it was that I yeah. had to read it for school. So anyway, that's the plan. <laughs> well, you need a splinter group to go off and read something <laughs> right. fun. We should consider that. Protest right, faction. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, moving moving on to fictional politics mm-hmm. of another sort. We watched the West Wing episode called The Fall's Gonna Kill You which is continuing in this five-episode block of the president's lying about MS coming Mm -hmm. to light and sort of unraveling. And in this episode, more people get to know it. We hear that Josh has been told. We see CJ talking to Babish about how she may have lied to the press. And we see Abby also having to talk to Babish about her signing of Zoe's medical form without mentioning Mm -hmm her father's MS, and it's starting to, Babish is illustrating for people more and more the really, really bad yes. situation they're in, and, you know, uh, he gets a lot of grief for it, but he is, he is being a friend. Well, and he's and doing yet, his job. Nobody mm-hmm. is much appreciating him as such. He is, and I think he's doing it in a fairly straightforward and not snotty way. Everyone is so defensive. Yes. Which I I understand, you know, why they are. But on the other hand, no one seems to get like, wow, this is serious. And this person is here to try to mitigate as much harm as we can. And they just really don't want to help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I understand why Abby was pissy with him because she's she's fully in it. She didn't she she's fully in it. Plus, which. She sort of had an agreement that would have prevented this from happening. And the fact that he's mm-hmm. now, he's kind of right. going back on it. So I think she has a little right to be pissy. CJ, I don't know what her problem was. I would have liked to have heard that there was some backstory with her and Oliver. I don't know. But she was just really. Well, you do find, by the end of, by the, end of the episode, snippy. you find out that she yes. may have suspected something because she saw the injection. Right happen um, yes and she chose not to ask right right that's true but she seemed to be like personally <laughs> picking on him <laughs> like him teasing him about his divorces or yeah they had like a little negative banter going on whatever it is between like josh and donna that's like positive banter they had the mm-hmm. evil, right. the evil twin they're both picking at each other in a very uncharming way but yeah, you know, you got to feel for CJ realizing how much of a mess she's Well, when in. he asks and... her, you know, have you ever lied to the press about his health? <laughs> I forget exactly what the question is. And, and she yeah. just looks at the camera and says, uh-huh. many, many times. And you're like, oh. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought she would say, <laughs> you know, know not on trouble. purpose or not without, you know, not deliberate, right. not without knowing or yeah. without knowing. But that's not what she says. Yeah. And I like that Toby has gone from being the original ticked off person to hear the news to now being the counselor for those right. who go after him. It's in, you know, when he tells Sam at the end, I'm going to be in my office after we had heard CJ right. say that he had said that to her. Oh, that's going to be an uncomfortable. It's interesting that they're not showing the the conversations yeah. every time i mean i suppose that would end up being repetitive yeah. but you know you're not seeing yeah cj's reaction josh's reaction sam's reaction when mm-hmm. they find out it's all sort of after the fact right um which is a which is yeah. a choice they're making right i guess toby's interaction was powerful mm-hmm. enough that we don't need to sort of see it again he's the one who would probably react 
most strongly right. in the room. I think CJ and Josh would probably mm-hmm. be a little more diplomatic. And I don't know about Sam, but he's just going right. to be stunned. <laughs> oh, these poor, you feel so so bad for them you know they've been working hard and starting to feel like they were doing well and then this is just going to completely derail everything for the time being so that's too bad i do love the scene one of my favorite scenes of the west wing is that one at the airport with josh and joey lucas amazing and the way that her interpreter not being there and just the way that her being a, a deaf person adds drama to that scene, mm-hmm. not in a bad way, but just in a, it forces them to have to communicate in different ways, right. in a number of different ways. Whereas otherwise, it's just a straightforward, hey, here's what's going on, and she goes back to L.A. Mm-hmm. So it really made that scene so much more dramatic. And it was interesting on the podcast hearing that it just mostly happened because they couldn't afford to bring and the guy no who Kenny. plays the interpreter. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so they're saving money, and out of it, he just makes this um, wonderful scene that is so, like, so many times more effective. Yes. The way it was done with the combination of lip reading and her speaking and him doing the um, finger signs and writing things down and all of that. It was just a beautiful mm-hmm. scene. I really, really loved the way that is. And it seems to me to be a really great example of why you want some diversity in your casting. Right. Because look what comes right. of it, you know? There's no way that scene is as effective in any mm-hmm. other way. So um, I love that. I'm always happy to see that yeah. again. And it was interesting hearing them talk about it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was, it, uh, the, the podcast was very interesting for all the, the talking about interpreters. And like she was saying about that somebody like Joey wouldn't want to use ASL because it leaves too much room for the interpreter to interpret that there's a different kind of sign that they would use that exactly replicates. Right, I had no idea. I had no idea either. And that was very interesting and that there were different philosophies amongst different uh, deaf people as to what they like, mm-hmm. how they like it, you know, what they want to see when they go to a play. Do they want to see it exactly in the sequence or do they want to see it in... Very right. interesting. And the whole, all the discussion about um, how she prefers to have a male interpreter um, yes. instead of a female one for certain situations, but then in other situations she right. wants a female one. And yeah, fascinating. that was interesting. <clears throat> It was, a ch- it was a little bit of a challenge listening to the podcast because I kept forgetting that it was her talking. Right. I was thinking her interpreter was talking. Then I realized, no, when he's saying I, he's... He's being Marley. He's, yes. It's her. And so that was, you know, that's a good challenge right. to have to figure mm-hmm. that out. So that was nice that they did that. I'm glad. But, um... So then we had the side plots in this episode of the tobacco and the satellite and eh. Yeah, I think I, I agreed with yeah, what okay. they said in the podcast where some of it was just too on the nose. Like, you know, the sky <laughs> is falling. Oh, really? The sky is falling. I didn't notice. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yep, gotcha. I did think that the actor who played the tobacco guy did a great job of just a mix of of weariness and resignation and righteous anger. Right. And just sort of summed up by that briefcase and that, you know, just the, the sort rumpledness of hang doggishness. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> he did a very good job, I thought. And I also have no idea. I've never known why Ed and Larry are laughing when they give that memo to Donna. I know. I would expect them to like be making a big deal out of it to prank right. her. The laughter makes Man. no sense. But, Agreed. Yes, but it's just it's just that kind of time in the West Wing where everything's all messed up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're laughing about things that are serious. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> have, Ed, have Ed and Larry figured out that they're going to be, you know, I don't know. What did they do that's going right. to get them in trouble? But anyway, so so this was a, this was another good episode in this march towards the episode mm-hmm. two cathedrals which is, um, I'd forgotten how, how much I enjoyed these episodes leading up to it. I sort of forget about everything between 17 people and two cathedrals because those are the two, right. they're the bookends, and they're both really powerful episodes. But these one in, ones in between are good too, and just the gathering sense of doom. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and how you can work hard doing something good and then find out that you've committed a crime and are going to 
at least be raked over the coals by people you hate, if not Right, if not worse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, well, next week we continue with the next to last episode in this group of five, which is 18th in Potomac. Probably pronouncing the name of that street wrong, but... um, No, I think that's how you say it, Potomac. Potomac, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will talk about that next week everybody watch it with us so you can listen along yeah and now we are moving on to our challenge round uh, where each week one of us challenges the other to see something they have not seen uh so this time i challenged you to finally get around to watching (laughs) the last five years which is a movie starring anna kendrick and jeremy jordan Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um based on a musical uh, by Jason Robert Brown and on stage. I understand it's just one or the other of them singing. There's not any interaction except in that one number in the middle. They're okay. just um, one of them sings and then the other one sings. So you don't see them relating to one another. You don't see extras. You don't see, you don't have any dialogue. You don't have any of that. Yeah, the I was movie, wondering how that would be yeah. accomplished on stage. The, yeah, the movie, of course, adds lots of scenery and some dialogue and lots of extras and cuts of, you know, to different places and all of that and uh, has two very, you know, young and attractive and appealing leads and... I really enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed watching it again this time. I enjoyed every time I watch it. I leave, you know, humming the songs. Mm-hmm. But it mostly makes me want to see it on stage because I bet it would be a lot more powerful and a lot more complex, I think. Mm-hmm. Even though even though the movie keeps the structure of it's just uh, if people who haven't seen it, it's pretty much all sung. And it's the story of a love affair with the woman is telling the story backwards and the man is telling the story forwards and they alternate songs. So you know right from the very opening number that these people are doomed. Yeah. (laughs) And and every happy song that comes after, you know that they're doomed. Plus there's all these little string parts that get repeated, these little melancholy series of notes Mm -hmm. that remind you you know this (laughs) you think you're happy now just wait you ain't spending the next 10 lifetimes together Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's going to be nobody who will ever remember you together so it's it's very sad in that sense it's sad all the way through it's sad from the beginning and then it's sad as you see it work back till to the end on his end um basically two people making themselves and each other unhappy in a variety of ways so it's the feel-good movie of the year (laughs) (laughs) what did you think of it Catherine? well i did not cry you did not cry you're strong somehow had a heart of stone (laughs) it may be because i kind of knew what was gonna happen although i mean anybody would when if because the beginning (laughs) gives it away i mean the big if i was gonna cry i would have been in that very first song but i didn't know them yet but i mean her Uh face when she is singing that song is unbelievable (laughs) just and i mean at one point she like sheds a single tear but it's very powerful when she's when she's crying um or when she just just the sad look on her face yes Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I think I would need to watch, I felt as soon as it was over, I wanted to watch it again. Um, well, well, you can, because see, it's a continuous loop, because at the end, you see her right. walking in to sing what will be her, her first, first song, song so you just start over. Yeah. It goes around and around. Right. And it, it I, I felt like I would get a lot out of it, out of watching it again. Um, well, you know what you can do instead of watching it again? get a hold of the Broadway cast right. album because that's pretty much watching mm-hmm. it again except that you can be walking around right. and, stuff. <laughs> and I I've I recognize many of the songs actually from uh-huh. hearing them on the Broadway channel um, yeah but now you have them in context exactly. yes um and I thought you know you sent me the Linda Holmes piece, which was uh-huh. the list of all the songs in order of how much they make you cry. Yes. And and honestly, audience, whether you cry or not, it's worth watching the movie 
so that you can understand that article because it's really funny. And it's such a I really good it. piece of criticism and analysis yes. of of the movie mm-hmm. and the music. Um, it's really, really well done. It, it really... Yes that's when I was reading it, I was like, oh, I missed that. I missed that. I missed that. You know, I need to go <laughs> yes. back and, and watch it again yeah. so I know exactly yeah. what she means there. Um, yeah. it's really impressive the, what she puts together. Yeah. The whole thing about the, the melody, that one melody that you hear at the beginning and in the middle being the same one he sings at the end, I think mm-hmm. I missed that the first bunch yes. of times. And then, wow, is it a gut punch when you realize that's what it is. What you're hearing at the beginning, that little jaunty tune, is really him saying, I can't rescue you, goodbye. So, and then there's this, there's this little four note. I would, I would try to sing it, but I'll get it wrong. But this little sort of um, four note thing that goes throughout, you keep hearing it as, you know, and it's just, every time you hear it, it's like, oh Mm -hmm. yeah. (laughs) So it's just, did you get the, the. Uh, you probably had read that there was a line that Hamilton took from this um, that nobody needs to know. Oh, yeah. From from Say No to This, he picked up from the mm-hmm. end of... Uh, nobody needs Picked up from the know. end of Jamie's yep. cheating song. So mm-hmm. that was nice. Everybody who's familiar with this sat up when they heard that in Hamilton and said, Hey, like, <laughs> oh, well, I know that. <laughs> so he got permission. He asked and uh, I, quoted it. Yes, I'm sure they were... <laughs> <laughs> not not sad about yeah. it yeah it's it's very interesting to think about seeing it on stage and because I think in some ways it would be easier to follow in other ways it would be hard yes. to follow yes um because in the movie although you know each song is told from one or the other's perspective mm-hmm. But they're they're both present and singing it to each other so you can forget like who's yeah who's in charge of this song which I, yeah i think kind of makes it a little more confusing maybe um right it, I, I think, think on stage too. and also when you have them doing it together i think it influences your opinions more you know mm-hmm. when you see him singing something and her looking devastated or whatever right. as linda holmes mentions they kind of put the thumb on the scale in favor of kathy in the movie which mm-hmm. might not quite be so uh, on stage I don't know and um I I would really be interested to see how that works and and uh, she mentions that the scene where he's talking right after he gets married talking about how hard it is now to ignore all these women if he's saying that to himself on a stage is one thing when he's saying it to all his bros while Buddies. he's drinking yeah it's a little ickier mm-hmm. uh, you know it's like good self-deprecation if he's thinking it to himself not so much yes. when he's telling his buddies how many women are throwing themselves in him. So and you and you see it actually happening, and yes, you see exactly, them yeah, basically was... not resisting. It. <laughs> That's right. I was watching this with my daughter, and I was very happy that she watched it with me, and she stayed with it for the whole thing. And at first, I was trying to explain, okay, because you know I've seen it a lot of times, and it is a mm-hmm. weird structure. I was trying to explain things, but she stayed with it and she watched the whole thing. I was really happy. But there was that one scene where he goes into the gets off the elevator, and the girl's sitting there in her bra, and she's yes. like, "Why doesn't she have a shirt on?" And I'm like, right. "Okay, <laughs> uh, they're taking some imagination liberties there." Right. But um, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I do think I don't know if it's just that Anna Kendrick is so appealing, and you know, I think you do sympathize with her in the movie more. I think it doesn't help that that Jeremy Jordan is a really handsome dude and so therefore you're more likely to think he's a dog i don't think it's necessarily the same in the stage version Mm -hmm. but in the movie version i think certainly she is more sympathetic although really both of them you know it's it's in addition to all the musical cues and the fact that the thing is told backwards and forwards it's pretty clear really from even the happy songs that they're doomed Mm -hmm. because if the reason he's attracted to you is completely because you're not Jewish and anything else about you would be just (laughs) a-okay and if she's interested in you because she thinks she can do better than you know the girl in high school and the loser boyfriend those aren't really firm foundations to to, uh, base the next 10 lifetimes on so you know it seems like they're both kind of 
looking for something. I mean, he's clearly looking for life experiences that he can write about. Mm-hmm. And she's clearly looking for some sort of rescue. And, oh, kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Just date for a and while. And they are and very then... young. I mean, they... Yeah. They meet when they're like 23 and, or at Mm -hmm. least he is, maybe she's even younger and, you know, and they're married and divorced by five years later. So yeah. Or not divorced, but splitting up by five years later. Yes. So on their way. So I enjoyed it. Yeah. And then, and the music is great. I mean, like I said, I do, I recognize some of the songs like summer Mm -hmm. in ohio is kind of yes fun song (laughs) like (laughs) it is um that one and the one where she's auditioning is another song that i i recognized um yeah i remember when i first heard of it was i was listening to like a broadway radio channel i think on itunes Mm -hmm. and they played songs from that from time to time and i had to look it up and figure out what it was about and uh, then i would listen to the actual cast album from it which is very good one of these days, someone somewhere will put it on someplace where I can see it, or they'll tape it and I'll watch mm-hmm. it. But uh, on in yeah, the meantime, it'd be very interesting. I enjoy to watching see it on stage. Going back to the movie on Netflix every now and then and listening to the mm-hmm. album, which is almost like watching. Yeah. And uh, there we go. So you have a challenge for me for next week. Yes, something that I have long exactly. resisted. Exactly. This is <laughs> this is the pulp and possibly been sarcastic. This is the about. whole point of the challenge round. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was coming from the exactly. moment from the moment we had this idea. I knew that eventually, eventually, I would have to watch some you Downton would be Abbey. Forced to watch Downton Abbey, <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do. We are going to make Terry watch All right. the very first episode of Downton Abbey. There's, there's many episodes that I considered, um, but there is uh-huh. general agreement that the pilot is is really well done and. It, of course, sets the scene for everything that comes after it. So, um, so yeah, Downton Abbey, Season 1, Episode 1. Right. It is available right. on Which... iTunes. Um, and if you happen to be a member of your, at least for, for me, it's they have it on PBS.org, but you have to be a member of your local um, public television station in order to access okay. it so your mileage may vary but that is that is the way it works for where <laughs> i live um but yeah All itunes right. and i know public libraries have it too so that's right yes okay well that will be it for our round two today please subscribe to our parenting roundabout podcast so you won't miss any of our episodes including our daily speed rounds and weekly group chats as always you can find recaps links and an opportunity to comment on our website at Goodbye, Catherine. Bye, Terry. Goodbye, everybody.